me and she encouraged me to think of him like a co-therapist when I'm working because that orientation to kindness, to honesty, to the real stuff of being human in this world and having relationships with others and not to be too stuck in what philosophy might say. That's not that it doesn't have a place or a voice, but really thinking what's practical. He gave a talk in 1981 to the Jewish, to the gay Christian movement, just a year after he'd come out. And in that, he spoke about not avoiding or evading the the real questions, the real questions that come up from being gay and Jewish at that time, or gay and Christian at that time, for religious practitioners. He spoke about religious leaders who would say very different things in private with, you know, if a gay member or a queer member of their community came to them, they would say one thing, but then what they said from their pulpits was very, very different. And he spoke about those divisions, that there's a sort of rabbis who are also counsellors feeling they could do one thing as a counsellor, but not as a rabbi, and that that tension. And then also he spoke about the committees and councils that would decide and determine where queer life should and shouldn't be in religious circles without consulting anyone who actually was experiencing that life. So um, I think he would be thrilled to see tonight and to see this incredible panel that we have. Um, When we celebrated in Parliament a Hanukkah party with Keshet UK, I remember Lionel saying, built by Jewish women in the WASP milieu of the women's liberation movement. Later that year, Israel invaded Lebanon and the women's liberation movement got caught up in an anti-Israel, anti-Zionist sentiment expressed expressed chiefly through the weekly Xeroxed Women's Liberation Movement newsletter and the monthly journal Spare Rib. Our Jewish lesbian group began to write letters. We also started reading Jewish writers. One of the books we tackled was Emil Fackenheim's The Jewish Return into History. After we read the chapter about the 614th commandment, Thou shalt not give Hitler a posthumous victory, I began to feel compelled to commit myself more fully to Jewish communal existence. I had been a lesbian separatist. I was still a radical feminist when I decided in 1983 to apply to the LBC rabbinic program. I was motivated by two imperatives, to contribute to the rejuvenation of Jewish life after the Shoah, and to do what I could to help transform the Jewish community so it would become fully inclusive. From the outset, it was a struggle. During the interview process, Sheila and I were subjected to two psychological assessments rather than the usual one. When we were accepted, we were put on probation for the full five years of the rabbinic program. Inquiring about the terms of probation and what behavior might constitute a breach, we were told that no one knew, that we might be asked to leave at any time if the two movements that funded the college were not happy. Our situation remained precarious right up to ordination. It was for this reason that we insisted that the names of the ordinance should appear on the ordination invitation so the college couldn't back out at the last moment. Even after we received Smicha, since we were both taking up positions under the auspices of the reform movement, the rabbinic assembly spent an entire day debating whether or not we should be accepted as members. During the challenging obstacle course for rabbinic training, establishing a connection with a Jewish gay and lesbian group and leading the monthly Erev Shabbat Havarah services provided a much needed oasis of support and solidarity. And it's so lovely to see you here. So much has changed over the past 35 years. I will say more when I reflect on formative moments in my queer rabbinate. Suffice it to say now, When I retired at the end of April 2021, over after over just 20 years as Rabbi of Brighton and Hope Professor Synagogue, I had the satisfaction of knowing that the congregation had been transformed into a proud, vibrant, and inclusive centre of Jewish life. I think my question to those online was, what do queer rabbis bring to community? When I was a child, I only knew two lesbians, a hairdresser and a rabbi my only queer role models. 
I would be useless at cutting hair. My only option was to become a rabbi. I grew up at FRS, where Rabbi Sheila Shulman, Zichrona Livracha, worked part-time. The fact that Sheila was vocal and out as a lesbian had a huge impact. Whilst I didn't know if my family or friends would eventually accept me when I came out, I always knew there was a place for me in Judaism, in community, and unlike so many of my friends, I never worried about God's judgment for being a lesbian. When I came out at age 16, I called Sheila, who invited me to her own community, BKY. I was incredibly nervous walking in, but Sheila greeted me at the door and opened her arms, embracing me in a massive bear hug. I cannot emphasize enough how much that hug and growing up in a community with an out rabbi meant to me. Queer rabbis offer that through our visibility. People of all ages know that there is a place for us within liberal and reform Judaism. Our public profiles demonstrate, even to those who don't belong to progressive denominations, they have a place in Judaism. People of other religions have said, Knowing the existence of out rabbis has shown they don't have to abandon faith in order to live a queer life. Our existence has even impacted national laws. Through the work of queer rabbis, the progressive movements provided opportunities to religiously affirm LGBTQ relationships before it was illegal. The precedent of progressive rabbis officiating ceremonies led to religious as well as civil queer marriage being legalized in the UK. If queer rabbis had not been allowed to be ordained, the world would have missed out on all the other qualities each of us as individuals bring to the rabbinate. One of my favorite quotes from Rabbi Lionel Blue, Zichrona Livracha, has nothing to do with gayness, but gives a glimpse of the riches he and each LGBTQ rabbi offer the wider community, and it seemed particularly apt for this time. When I asked, why God don't you take a hand in the dreadful happenings of the world? Why do you do nothing? It occurred to me that God has no hands to do anything with, or rather, and the penny dropped. I was God's hands. Why don't you take a hand in it comes why don't I take a hand in it. After I accepted this too close connection, prayer became much more real, but much less comfortable. When I applied to rabbinical school, during three days of interviews, a third of questions asked of me were about my sexuality yet not one about God. I was profoundly fortunate at Leo Beck College to have Rabbi Eli Sarah as my mentor. She prepared me for what I might encounter in the rabbinate, as well as offering me advice, care, challenge and friendship to this day. As queer rabbis, we support and enable the next generations each of us hoping their journey will be easier than our own. One Friday night, during my first year at Leo Beck College, Ellie invited me to a service at the Jewish Gay and Lesbian Group. During discussion, someone made a comment which was horrifying and racist. Ellie was admirable in strongly challenging the statement. Through her own experiences of homophobia, she was vocal in calling out other forms of bigotry. There is also something more nuanced queer rabbis offer, which I struggle to articulate. Not everyone grew up with Sheila as their rabbi or went through rabbinical school with Ellie as their mentor. Most of us have had to battle with whether we belong in Judaism and what that means textually, 
communally and spiritually. If the result of that wrestling means we choose to remain within Jewish community, there is depth and complexity in our thinking and connection with Judaism long before beginning rabbinical school. We also know how it feels to be outsiders and can empathize with those in our communities who feel other for myriad reasons. We, had, we have battled homophobia and transphobia. We have had struggles about whether our own communities will accept us, whether we would be employed and able to earn a living as a rabbi. Not always being embraced by the mainstream and feeling on the periphery mean our thinking can be more radical, challenging conventional Judaism, sometimes leading to widespread evolution of thought. Of course, some queer rabbis either choose to assimilate, mimicking straight models of existence, or are pressured into barely mentioning their identity. I did this myself for part of my rabbinate. However, I reject the notion that we're just like everyone else. Queer existence, queer relationships, and queer gender identity are not modeled on millennia of normative tradition. We have to forge our own paths. This means we bring our unique, diverse identities and perspectives to community, leading to creativity, innovation, and action. Sheila founding BKY, the incredible books Lionel, Ellie, and Sheila have written, Rabbi Indigo Raphael's meaningful chaplaincy work, and Rabbi Lev Taylor founding the Queer Yeshiva are just a few small examples. Well, they're not small, they're actually huge. Um, it's important to acknowledge that we have a friend and colleague who had so much to offer community and should be with us today. Andreas Hinz, Zichrona Livracha. In her Tisha B'Av sermon in 2002, immediately after we received news of Andy's death, Sheila wrote, we are in all reality faced today with an incomprehensible destruction, the brutal murder of a gentle, loving, gifted young man whom some of us call student or friend, a young man who was part of us, part of our community. For those of us who are lesbian or gay, he was also our brother in a struggle that is by no means over. Evening, everyone. I'm Indigo and my pronouns are he, they. He reflects my identity as a trans man and they reflects my non-binariness. And also I have a history which is really important in my life still today. And like all of us, I have a multiplicity of identities as a son, a sibling, a nephew, a beloved, a friend, and so much more. I'm not an ideology or an issue to be pathologized, nor is my existence about erasing anybody else's existence or threatening anyone. And you can't catch transness by using my pronouns. <laughs> I'm appalled at the demonization and callous statements made by our Prime Minister, Home Secretary and Equalities Minister about our lives as trans and gender variant people. The dehumanization and hysteria about our existence is disrespectful and it's hurtful. We shouldn't have to justify who we are, nor should our lived experiences be gaslighted. The Hebrew blessing Shehechianu ends Shehechianu Vikiamanu Vahigianu Lazman Hazer, expressing thanks to the source of life who has kept us alive sustained us and enabled us to reach this time. Well, tonight is definitely a Shehechianu moment for me. It's significant to be back at FRS after what happened 23 years ago 
when I interviewed for the position of principal rabbi. The experience was so impactful personally and professionally. And there is a poignancy being here with my colleagues to talk about the legacy of queer rabbis. For nine years, I've worked as a congregational rabbi, and for the past 18 years, as Judith mentioned, I've worked as a healthcare chaplain, providing faith-specific and generic support. Uh, so I'm Rabbi Anna Wolfson, um, and I'm the most recently ordained, just about, we were at college together, uh, rabbi on the Bima, and my experience is very different to um, those upon who those giants upon whose shoulders I stand, I really feel that um, my experience was so made so much easier um, because of, of so many people who had to struggle um, really hard in order for, for not not in order that my experience be easier, but my experience was much easier um, because of that. Um, I grew up in Nottingham. Uh, there aren't very many Jews in Nottingham. There are two uh, Jewish communities, uh, but not very many Jews. And so being Jewish felt so much a bigger part of my identity than any sort of queerness. Um, and I actually put some of that down, maybe all of that down to Section 28. So I didn't have, I, I was at school during Section 28. It, it was um, rescinded partway through uh, while I was in secondary school, but the damage had long already been done and has taken, I think, half a generation um, for that damage to um, to, in some way be undone. But don't worry, because our, our politicians have got more things up their sleeve to uh, to make sure that more children are damaged uh, going forward. Um, so I didn't have any I didn't feel like I had any um, LGBTQ plus um uh, a representation to to kind of look to so it took me I think I was quite young when I when I realized that I might be in some way queer and um, but it took me a long time until my uh, kind of early mid-20s to really feel comfortable with that identity in any way and I was really quite dismissive of, of it what does it mean what, what this is just an insignificant part of my identity uh, which I don't think I feel now um, so I, I grew up in Nottingham and um, I was really, a, a, I was very involved in LJY Netzer, which was Olpsnik Netzer once upon a time. And um, in a way of trying to be inclusive and maybe as well because of Section 28, which I blame for so much, um, there was uh, this kind of don't ask, don't tell policy about um, sexuality. As someone in the room might remember this, it might have been the same in RSY and other movements as well, of kind of if the if the straight people don't share about their sexuality or relationships, then that will help protect anyone who who is um, queer in any way from having to share. And it was it was kind of posed in that way. But again, it meant that there were no uh, role models uh, to look up to. So I think that for me, I um, since being ordained, I had the real great privilege. I worked at Norwich. I was chaplain. I also got to work with BKY. And it's lovely to see so many people here who I, I met through BKY and with the, um, LGBT, the Jewish LGBT group as well. Um, and I really feel strongly as part of my rabbinate, it's about being that representation and, and being that role model. And it means that sometimes I agree to doing things that I then maybe think I shouldn't have done, like tomorrow and my wedding being put in the um, the JC wedding magazine and things like that, just so that people could see that it's, it's possible if you want that. Uh, but I... I'm babbling now, but I do feel that as a big part of, of my rabbinate is being that role model and that representation. Um, I'm Judith Rosenberry. I was, uh, no, hang on, I'm Judith Rosenberry. I was brought up in Beaconsfield, um, which has, I think, two notable Jewish connections. I think the first one is that Disraeli, although, you know, obviously Disraeli did a little bit of a conversion at some point in order to become prime minister of the country. But um, so Disraeli was the MP of Beaconsfield for quite a long time, obviously before I was born. Um, <laughs> but I did hang out in, I did hang out in a pub called the Earl of the Beaconsfield, I think it was, and it had a big picture of Disraeli out, outside it. So there was that. And then I realised, um, in fact, quite recently, that uh, Claude Montefiore um, had a house in Beaconsfield, and he lived in a place called Burke's Road, and the houses are really huge. And I'm pretty sure, again, he would have been dead by then, but I delivered newspapers to that house when I was a little bit smaller. So anyway, uh, that's uh, that's Beaconsfield, me and my Jewish connections. Um, what did I do then? Then I kind of um, 
I did what a lot of people did. I didn't really, um, I wasn't that interested in religion. So I became a sort of Marxist sort of thing. And then I went on to become a feminist and I was at Greenham Common for quite a long time, uh, which was very exciting uh, with a bunch of Manchester radical lesbian feminists, which was a, which was a great fun. We went down to Newbury to the pub and annoyed everybody a lot. Um, and then I met Sheila, and Sheila was a massive influence, as most of you probably realise. And at some point, I thought I would like somehow to be a little tiny bit like Sheila. So we had long conversations about whether I could go to the college and and uh, train to become a rabbi and that application was successful. I had five years at the college, which was absolutely wonderful. And Sheila was teaching there, which was an added bonus. And then I was ordained by her in 2009. Then when Sheila retired from BKY, I became the rabbi there, which was an extraordinary experience, the best um, in my life. Um, not always smooth, but you know, there you go. That's, that's congregational life, uh, the realities of it. And then, um, actually, got, I'm going to finish now, um, but the question uh, that kind of revolves around the, the, the idea of whether lesbian rabbis can work mainstream or whether they're, they're always kind of like marginal figures uh, is actually quite a curious one for me because I've just spent eight years living on the Isle of Skye, which is quite an extreme um, form of being marginal. It's actually quite a long way from the from North London. Um, <laughs> although when people ask me about that, actually, there were quite lots of very interesting Jewish figures on the Isle of Skye, and they tended to be uh, dentists, solicitors, um, and not at all interested in, in community life. I think they were off on the sky to, to escape it. So thank you very much for listening to that. Um, to that, And uh, I guess I'll, I'll end there for the moment. Anyway, until we get back to the whole marginal issue. Um, I do want to begin by honouring the memories of uh, Sheila and Lionel. So I should start with a joke from, uh, from Lionel Blue. His joke goes like this. Two Jewish women meet on the street. One says, my son, I'm so proud of him. He's a financial whiz kid in the city. The other one says, looking a bit miserable, my, my son's a homosexual. And the first woman says, no, where's his office? <laughs> um, <laughs> May, I don't know, maybe his office might, might, be, in, might be in a shawl somewhere. Um, so, and I also want to honor, begin by honouring Sheila by saying that there will be no dumbing down in anything that I say this evening when it comes to Jewish theology. Maybe this is a bit of an in-joke, people, people who are in her class. If you haven't done the reading before coming to class, that really is uh, on you. Uh, and if, you, if I say anything that you don't understand, then I've got a contemporary Jewish religious thought, but you can look it up in there. And, uh, and how can you even consider yourself a serious Jew if you've not read the Buber Rosenzweig letters. You've got to, you've got to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with them before you uh, can even participate. In them. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I wanted to honor, honor Sheila with the kind of like seriousness. And I'm thinking about um, Sheila's legacy of, as one of ferocious truthfulness and Lionel's as disarming honesty. So I'm thinking about how I can, um, how I bring that and embody that. So I'll just say something a bit about why I, um, me uh, being a rabbi, why I became a rabbi. And this evening might uh, shed more, might, it's quite interesting for me in my journey of trying to understand it. So essentially, I think I became a rabbi because when I was a teenager, maybe it was the influence of Alex Wright, my rabbi, when I was young, um, I just fell in love with Torah. I just loved, love it. I loved it, love it. And I wanted to spend as much time as possible with her. So uh, I thought becoming a rabbi would be a good way to do that. But some other things also happened when I was a teen, when I was young. Um, so I'll say two incidents. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I attended a Kona Dre service for the first time. And this was the service where Ellie Sarah gave a sermon and people stormed out. And I was 10. I was just tying my, myself to my dad's sits here, not really paying attention. But I noticed over the days that followed that the adults in the synagogue went a bit crazy. And like these words kept being flown around, lesbian, gay, and I didn't, I didn't really understand what was going on, but I knew that something bad had happened. Um, and then a few years later, uh, at this point, I was an avid reader of the Jewish Chronicle. Uh, in the Jewish Chronicle, I was reading about the experiences of, uh, of, uh, of, of Indigo and applying to, applying to work at FRS. And there were a series of articles about this. And we read these articles and 
boys around the Shabbat dinner table made jokes about lesbian. It, it was very, very kind of unpleasant and confusing as a teenager. And all of this was before I had any sense of myself as the kind of the, 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 the definition or the designation gay man relating to myself. So all, so all I kind of understood was that being an LGBT rabbi is a, was a difficult thing where you, that you, were, you were at risk of being humiliated in some way. And so now I ask myself, on some kind of deep level, the psychoanalysts here might be interested in this, did I become a rabbi because of the homophobia that I witnessed? Did I follow Yaakov, and Sheila actually wrote about this story, into a dark valley because I will not leave until you bless me? Did I, in the language of Lurianic Kabbalah, enter the realm of the Klippot to find and raise the hidden sparks? Does that mean that this evening, where I have the privilege of sharing this panel with Ellie and with Indigo, does that mean that if this evening is, evening is a success, the sparks might finally be released, a tikkun might be enacted, the task of my rabbinate might then be negated? Will this evening make way for a return from the realm of the klipot, a return from the everythingness into the halal hapanui, panui, the nothingness. Will this evening enable a new symptom, a new journey, a new rabbinate, the pathway towards a Torah as yet unknown? So wonderful to listen. I mean, we actually had a Zoom call, um, which was really lovely to connect with each other. And I uh, just want to say what it means to sit with you all this evening. Um, so my question is, what have been the formative moments in my queer rabbinate? So the first formative moment. From the time that I entered Leobet College, I knew that I wanted to be a rabbi in a mainstream liberal reform synagogue so I could work with congregants to make congregational life more inclusive. I was thrilled when the shul I served as a fifth year student, Buckhurst Hill Reform Synagogue, invited me to be their first full time rabbi. Things went well for a couple of years, but then a small group began to agitate against me. One couple was afraid that I might molest their children, their daughters specifically. Fortunately, when it became clear that some people wanted to get rid of me, a groundswell of support which manifested itself at the AGM that year overcame the opposition. Grateful for that validation, I was nonetheless very disheartened by the homophobia that had preceded it. And when the post of director of the programs division and the reorganized RSGB was created, I applied and got the job starting in the autumn of 1994. The second formative moment. I loved my new role and felt, as they say, things could only get better. One development and one event fueled my optimism. At my suggestion, a rabbinic lay working party on same-sex commitment ceremonies was set up in 1995. A few months later, in February 1996, I appeared in my official capacity alongside Peter Tatchell on BBC Two's Heart of the Matter with Joan Bakewell on the issue of lesbian and gay equality. They also say that pride comes before a fall. In September that year, I gave the Kol Nidre sermon at Radlett and Bushy Reform Synagogue, the shul where, with the support of the then rabbi, Barbara Bortz, had begun teaching in the Hayden the summer before entering Leobet College. Addressing the theme of covenant, I mentioned that I was going to be conducting a co covenant of love ceremony for a lesbian couple. The immediate horrified reaction of a handful of people indicated that I had misjudged the moment. The broader reaction that followed Yom Kippur underlined the gravity of my mistake. I paid a very high price for it having to make multiple apologies, receiving hate mail, because there were those in the wider reform movement who no longer felt comfortable working with me. In March 1997, I offered my resignation, which was accepted. When I was preparing to leave RSGB in July 1997, Brighton Hope Progressive Synagogue was seeking a new rabbi. I applied, but was not invited to interview. Fortunately, after a visit in January 1998 to Leicester Progressive, one of the congregations I had served as a fourth year student, I was invited to be their first rabbi. 
I began working on a weekend a month basis six months later. The third formative moment. In July 2000, after I'd already moved to Brighton, Brighton and Hope Progressive Synagogue was once again looking for a rabbi. The then LJ Executive Director, Rabbi Dr. Charles Middleborough, urged me to reapply. Meanwhile, he encouraged the lay leadership to have an informal conversation with me. It was during that informal conversation with the congregation's chair and vice president, that the vice president referred to report on the Jewish Chronicles front page the previous Friday about the decision taken by Finchley Reform Synagogue not to employ a lesbian as full-time principal rabbi. The vice president asked me how to avoid that happening at BHPS. <laughs> I suggested that rather than leaving the decision to the congregation, the council, the shul's elected representatives should take responsibility for it. And that's exactly what happened. After leaving a Shabbat morning service, I was interviewed by the entire council. And although the vice chair objected, the majority were prepared to take a leap into the unknown and I was offered the job. The fourth formative moment. I started work on December 1st, 2000. Half a dozen member families resigned in the first six months. On Sukkot morning, 2001, I conducted a blessing ceremony for the two children of a lesbian couple who had joined the congregation when I became the rabbi. At Kiddush, the vice chair who had objected to my employment confronted the vice president. It was very gratifying to overhear her response. This family belongs to our shul, and all the congregants are entitled to receive the congregation services on an equal basis. The vice chair and his family subsequently left the shore. The fifth formative moment. I was a member of the LJ Rabbinic Working Party on same-sex commitment ceremonies set up in 2000. The new policy was ratified at the LJ Council in 2002 and the Working Party was tasked with creating a liturgy. With the publication of the new liturgy arranged for December 2005 to coincide with the Civil Partnership Act coming into force, and aware that there were a few BHPS council members who were not completely on board, I suggested that the council consider having homophobia, homophobia training before taking a vote on whether or not ceremonies might be conducted under the shul's auspices. The council agreed and attended two consecutive Sunday morning sessions conducted by my partner. Jess Wood, in her role as founder director of all sorts of charity working with LGBTQ youth in Brighton. Shortly afterwards, the council vote in, in support of same-sex ceremonies was unanimous. When two days after our civil partnership in March 2006, Jess and I celebrated our hooper at the shore, half the congregation attended. Achieving full acknowledgement for same-sex couples in the shore made it possible to redraft the synagogue leaflet to include a welcome to LGBTQ individuals, couples and families. It also meant that when I met with individuals on their journeys, some of whom were LGBTQ, I could reassure them that they could make a home in the congregation, feel valued for who they were, and be supported to make their own unique contribution to congregational life. The sixth formative moment, the rebuilding of the synagogue, which began in the autumn of 2011 and was completed 50 months later, created the opportunity for the congregation's vision of an inclusive community to be expressed in the fabric of our congregational home. In addition to refashioning the building so that it ensured complete physical accessibility, including a lift that could take a mobility scooter and the absence of a beamer, Attention was also paid to signalling a clear welcome to LGBTQ people. And so a beautiful rainbow art became the dominant feature of the sanctuary and alongside female and male toilets, all gender toilets too. In the past seven years since the rebuilding was completed, LGBTQ exhibitions and events have entered the shul calendar, including the annual Eve of Brighton Pride Erev Shabbat celebration the seventh and final formative moment. The redesigned building opened for the first time on Shabbat Hanukkah, December 12th, 2015, when we were celebrating the adult bat mitzvah of one of our lesbian members. 
present at Kiddush was one of our younger members whose bar mitzvah we had celebrated a few years earlier. I knew it was their birthday that day. I also knew that they were transitioning. I invited the congregation to sing her happy birthday. It was wonderful hearing everyone sing her new name. A few months later, we celebrated her again with a ceremony on Shabbat morning, sanctifying her transition when she received a Mishaberach in her chosen new Hebrew name. More recently, after my retirement, one of the young people who had come to speak with me a few years earlier, a trans man who'd later studied for his conversion with me, was elected to the Shul Council. In his new position, he was supported to organize the first eve of Trans Pride Ere Shabbat celebration in July. I'm very proud that BHPS continues to be a beacon of LGBTQ inclusivity. Thank you. I'm going to be talking about how I realized I was a queer rabbi. Uh, my queerness just evolved. And in the past, I've lived as a girl, as a woman, and as a lesbian. And I've come out numerous times and sometimes still do. And the search for greater congruency and my own integrity became stronger than my fear of people's reactions. In 2012, my transition began and taking testosterone has mean, meant having the privilege of being read as male, which I legally am. My relationship may look heteronormative, but that's based on a whole set of assumptions, as both myself and my beloved Ruthie continue to celebrate our queerness, and I hope we always will. I discovered just how queer I was as a rabbi through experiences of being othered. I didn't comply with the expectations of the prototype rabbi male, cisgender, heterosexual. The binaries allowed no space for anyone to inhabit the in-between or beyond. Now, as a child growing up in South Africa, I didn't have rabbinic role models I knew were LGBTQIA+. So I couldn't see myself reflected anywhere. My own community made me wary and it was challenging to contemplate an openly visible life. When I heard of Lionel's existence, Zichron or Levracha, it was through a homophobic rabbinic comment. Aside from the hurt that that evoked, it gave me strength to feel potential, possibility, and hope. And when I interviewed at the Obe College, I disclosed my sexuality. There was much to thank Rabbi Sheila Zichrona Levracha and Rabbi Eli, who had pioneered the way. And I had a year of probation, like everyone else in my class, and a supportive student journey. And I feel really blessed that my college mentor and friend, Rabbi Alex Wright, is here tonight. It also was very important to me that Sheila officiated at our same-sex commitment ceremony before I began officially at the college. As a rabbinic student, I returned to South Africa to give an address at the South African Union for Progressive Judaism, the SAUPJ conference, and spoke about my studies and I came out if I was going to serve in Durban or anywhere else in South Africa with my beloved, they needed it spelt out if they hadn't already intuited it. I was the where they might also need to digest the news before I returned to serve the community that birthed and nurtured me. Some people felt betrayed, angry, Disappointed their investment did not meet their expectations. There were no women rabbis at the time serving in South Africa. So to conceive of a lesbian woman rabbi being their first woman rabbi to serve was a step too far. The yardstick was rigorous. 
and I'm sure they never expected their male rabbinic students to disclose their sexual orientation. My disclosure brought some of the community hope and furthered conversations amongst Netzer, the youth movement, and the Durban Progressive Jewish Congregation and SCUPJ could not consider my return, and I remained in the UK. In 2000, whilst the congregational rabbi, I applied here at FRS. There were a number of applicants, and I was identified as the sole candidate who met the criteria for principal rabbi. What happened here surprised me, many of the congregation, and many of my colleagues. Rabbi Sheila was part-time here at FRS, and a group within the community didn't want their principal rabbi to also be a lesbian. One of the outcomes, other than not being appointed, was being given a quarter page apology in the Jewish Chronicle for the mismanagement of the application process and the intrusive questions that had been asked. I also received a letter of reference stating that not being appointed was not a reflection of my abilities. I've never shown that letter to anyone. Due to what happened, my sexual orientation was sensationalized, appearing on the front, middle, and back pages of the JC, which you read, Daniel, and in other newspapers, and lesbian prefaced any reference to my name. These experiences politicized me, sought to define me, and forced me to inhabit the queerness of othering and rejection. I've always felt the sum of aspects of my personhood and have never embraced being reduced to merely one aspect. I became more acutely aware of the need to find safe people and safe spaces where I could be who I was. I've also had experiences of queerness being a blessing. My sense of otherness, wounds, marginalization, grappling, rejection, searching, and love have in chaplaincy spiritual care enabled people to open up in deep ways as they intuit that it's all right to be who they are and share their stories, their fears, hopes, and dreams. My queerness is a non-verbal invitation to be you and to hold the legitimacy of your uniqueness. At work, I wear a trans lanyard with pride, though it can feel daunting being the only one doing so at times. In supporting patients, their families, friends, and staff, I am listening to people's stories and how they identify themselves and their relationships. It's been important to use whatever terminology reflects their lives, whether as mothers, fathers, parents, whether as trans, non-binary, male or female. We all need to feel our lives are acknowledged and respected rather than assumptions being made where we feel erased. For some people, gender additive language can feel inclusive. There must be a space to acknowledge and not be dismissive of the rainbow hues of our humanity. Coming out is also an inviting in. It's a sharing we entrust, inviting people to connect with our essence, the essence of who we are. It's an invitation to know more of us, to ask with a healthy curiosity, not a voyeuristic one, to encounter our humanity. But there are risks and times when for self-preservation and well-being, we need and have needed to stay in rather than come out. Some of the legacy of queer rabbis has been about struggle and rejection, about challenging and questioning, 
pioneering and widening vistas, nuances and creativity, potential and possibility, <clears throat> hope and joy, and certainly resilience. Gosh, it's very hard to follow both you, Ellie, and, and Indigo. Um, and I, I was asked, uh, what queer hopes do I have for the future? And I actually think that so much of what, what you both said was a lot more hopeful than some of the things that I have to say. Because uh, when I started writing this, I have to say I wasn't feeling hugely hopeful. Um, I used to think that the ideal um, was that sexuality and gender be an insignificant part of, um, of, of being in community. And that actually our mainstream communities be set up so that, oh, well, it doesn't matter who you are. Everyone's just just kind of the same anyway. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure, actually, that that's not the case, that that's not possible. Um, I'm not sure it's possible um, to be in mainstream community in that way uh, where everybody can fully be themselves. I feel like there's kind of an unwritten way of being and it, it might be multifaceted but there are kind of rules that you follow in, in being part of mainstream community um and so it sometimes can feel that people are having to set their identity aside and it might be in just different moments but at different points people are having to set their identities aside in order to be able to fit in with that mainstream community and that might be um a, a kind of symptom of queerness or it might be something that lots of people feel like they're doing in our mainstream communities um and I think it does go beyond queerness I think we're seeing at the moment and I'm, I'm maybe I'm sorry to be the first person to mention it but with everything that's going on in Israel and in Gaza at the moment um that some people are having to uh, a, a kind of people with what are seen as marginalized voices or, or who are not saying the kind of party line um, are being shunned in some way. It's those people over there that don't quite belong in the mainstream community. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of taking this, what are hopes, what do, what hopes do I have for queer future? I'm using queer really broadly. I'm speaking about LGBTQ uh, plus communities, but I'm also talking about queerness being marginalized in, in any way at all. Um, so that's kind of where, where I was feeling when I was writing this. So I'm sorry to start kind of not very hopeful and also with our political landscape. Um, and I mentioned too much Section 28, but thinking about what our, our politicians are talking about at the moment, particularly when it comes to trans um, people, trans bodies, trans identities, um, and how kind of once again, queer lives and queer bodies are being used as part of a a political game, it feels like sometimes. So where do we find hope in all of that? Well, don't worry, I won't keep with all the bleak. Um, it's been, it's so amazing to kind of reflect back. Amazing might not be the, the right word, but it's hopeful to, to see how far we've come um, and, and where we are. You know, we're, we're in one of these mainstream communities. We're in the heart of Northwest London in one of the most vibrant communities in Northwest London, having this panel with, with all of us speaking here. And that's something to be really hopeful about. I had the great privilege um, a few years ago of being the welfare officer um, on LJY Netz's summer camp Kadima. And I was completely blown away by the counterculture, by this, the, the hub, the community that was created there where um, these kids, these teenagers and young adults were able to completely be themselves, explore themselves, play with gender, play with all different types of identity um, in a really safe space where it was just seen as, uh, I don't want to use the word normal, but it, it was safe. It was everyone just experiencing that together. And I know that um, LJY Netza is not the only place where that happens. Um, I th the, the queer yeshiva was mentioned, it was... Um, Rabbi Lev Taylor and, and student Rabbi Haver, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten your last name. Say again. Oh. Kal Vachal. Um, and Joanna Phillips have set up this incredible space, which has just been growing and growing and growing. Another symbol, I think, of where people were really craving community, really craving a space which um, they could be themselves and explore different ways of being Jewish and different ways of existing. Um, there are so many wonderful, exciting things that are happening. And I, my hope for the future is that those things don't just stay marginalized. They don't just stay out there in the other with kind of the mainstream community thinking, oh, well, that's happening over there. So we can keep doing what we're doing over there at best, at worst, shunning the things that are happening over there. and. Um, 
accusing people of not being Jewish enough or not saying the right things or all sorts of horrible things that we've heard. So my hope for the future is that while all of those things are thriving um, in the way that mainstream community has done so many times, as we've heard, we, mainstream community can also be part of being the voice to move everything forward um, rather than holding us all back. I just want to, um, I, think the, I think the question in some way isn't obvious, but I think it does say something about the future direction of the queer rabbinate. Um, and it's something to do with where we're seen or how we're seen, literally. But I just want to say two things very quickly before I try and unpack the question a little bit. Um, I think the first thing is that this evening is couched in terms of queer legacy. And one of the people who we've referenced quite a lot tonight is Rabbi Sheila Shulman. And there's an ethics, I think, around memory. And I would say to honor Sheila that she would find it probably quite hard to understand herself in terms of having queer legacy. You know, Rabbi Sheila Shulman was a radical lesbian feminist. And whatever, you know, I don't know how Sheila would have run with it if she had, and it would have been wonderful if she'd still been alive today. We don't know. Um, but given that we know who Sheila was in the time that she was with us, I think it's probably, I think it's just probably right just to say um, that Sheila might have struggled uh, with that moniker, as I do, because I think I should say something very um, careful about how I understand myself within the taxonomy of queerness, because it's not a label that I have ever used to describe myself. I don't really know how I describe myself, actually, it's quite interesting. Um, but how I do understand, I suppose how I do understand myself, which links in a, a very interesting way for me with queer identity, queer theory, queer politics, is in that what was a pejorative label of being Michelin. I'm a mixling. Um, I don't, in a sense, um, conform with a, with a narrow sense of what being a Jew is. And in that sense, I think I, I appreciate the queer community and I hope that identifying as Michelin um, connects me to the queer community because the queer community has a very expansive and generous notion in a way of not closing identities down. So thank you for, for bearing with me when I, I kind of try to think through that issue for myself. So what I do think is important, trying to kind of get back to the question of margins and marginality, is that with the queer community and in alignment with queer thought, the what is less important than the where. Now, that might sound like a bit of a kind of strange thing to say, but it gets back to that sense that if you try to define yourself, you close definitions down. But where you locate yourself is what's really important, which is why I need to talk a little bit more about possibly why we need to, you know, however we identify within that queer taxonomy, that queer spectrum, how and why the margins are still relevant and important to us. To be queer involves a conscious understanding of positionality, where you locate yourself. Because where you locate yourself influences your perspective and perspective is really, really crucial. So where the queer rabbi is, is very, very important. Now, of course, my brilliant friends and colleagues here have already illustrated the point in numerous ways. 
But a lot of queer rabbis obviously don't have a choice often where they're located because we need jobs. But if self-identifying as queer rabbis, we end up working within, just for the sake of argument, heteronormative contexts and communities, we're at risk of disappearing into that normativity. Or what my favorite uh, philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas would have said, we would be disappeared into the same. Because the norm, lovely though it often is, uh, is often overwhelming. And its task, possibly not in all our synagogues, but certainly in society is to convert and subsume what is other into what is its likeness. So that is a problem for us. But if queer rabbis insist on their positionality being marginal, which is basically how I've kind of lived my life, other to the norm, then they, we, I, also risk disappearing because we reside in the periphery. And that means that we're out of sight. So neither of these scenarios is great <laughs> for the future of the queer <laughs> rabbinate. So perhaps what we need to recognize is the complexity of the boundary. The thing that demarcates the inside from the outside and the margin from the center. Because often what we do when we identify as an insider, mainstream, normative, or outsider, marginal, queer, is not a matter of two discrete bodies, bounded thinking and communities, but actually a dynamic that revolves around a kind of constant negotiation of multiple boundaries that are constantly intersecting and being transgressed and reinforced continually. Now, I'm not sure whether this understanding of the fluctuating boundary, which sounds slightly odd, but sounds like something, yeah, anyway, um, is, a, is a future solution for the queer rabbi's positionality. But it does build a little bit on what Rabbi Sheila Shulman taught many years ago, which is that if we can find a place of overlapping commonalities or the zvishan, the betweenness where we can come together with imagination and creativity to find, as Anna was saying, new ways of being and seeing and doing Judaism without the queer bit being subsumed or relegated or disappeared, then I think we're onto something. It sounds a little bit simplistic, but you know, I'm happy to run with it for a bit. But the legacy of the queer rabbinite then is I think this extraordinary thing that I've only ever really found explored so extraordinary within queer theory, which is potentiality. And queer rabbis, the queer community, queer thinking is all to do with understanding the unrealized and it tries to bring the unrealized potential about. So although that's a little bit of a kind of confused message to, to leave you with, it is one of hope. And of course, I, I thank my colleagues very much because I think that we've, we've kind of explored that uh, this evening. And we've got Daniel to come, of course. But
even understanding of messy words like integration and healing, I thought and I thought that I could and that I should bring my whole self to Torah. I was wrong. Let me explain. <laughs> um, at the uh, at the talks that uh, Rabbi Lionel Blue used to give, at the for example, uh, I well, remember one at LJS uh, when there was Pride Shabbat. He would uh, tell the story of the Ten Commandments of the gay of the gay sauna, and he's got a section in this book where he writes about it as well. So I want to I want to talk a bit about this, and I want to I want to bring um, Sheila's seriousness with theological analysis to Lionel's amazing honesty. Uh, to what would it be like to read? analyze Lionel as a serious theologian. So, which he was. No, I mean, I've got a lot to say about that. I've just read this whole thing. I've got a lot of thoughts on that. But anyway, so following, Lionel said, uh, tells us that following an orgy in a gay sauna in Amsterdam, he had a revelation. Uh, and the rev in the revelation, God spoke to him and gave him the commandments, the mitzvot of the gay sauna. These include things like, don't do the night before, we are going to regret in the morning after. If you've made an appointment to meet someone, keep it, even if you've met someone more attractive in between times. If the person you're going to say no to is an oldie, be especially considerate because you'll be old one day. <laughs> Don't feel like a scolded cat from someone that you've just, uh, and run away from someone that you've just made love to. And don't hand out blank checks on the affections you, uh, you can't cash. Now, it would be a conventional thing to, to potentially read the mitzvot that he listed as ethics, but I'm I'm really I'm really committed to not understanding mitzvot in the narrow sense of ethics, and instead understanding them as more expansive, maybe in a Rosenzweigian way, as related revelation, and therefore the mitzvot that arise from revelation are always in relationship with redemption, and therefore with the messianic, uh, with the not yet, with the with the world that we're creating. So when when I heard Lionel's stories back in the day, and uh, when I was when I was young and attending these services. I heard this story from the perspective of what I'm going to call the messianism of progressive liberal inclusion. So that means that I heard this, his, that this story in the following way. Luchatchila, in the first instance, now that gay sex is decriminalized, and we even have these new liberal Jewish mitzvot of coming out, gay marriage and adopting a child if you want, in, in, now that we have those, we, I've actually lost the logic of it. Okay, so, so in the first instance, the situation is different and we don't need to, and we can have uh, come out and have gay marriage. But Dieved, in a past age, when we didn't have those things, then you might go to the gay sauna in Amsterdam, have sex with strangers. And in that case, Lionel's mitzvot would apply. That's how I used to read it. And now as a result of, a series of what I would describe, kind of refer to as difficult experiences, maybe just getting older, I, I kind of think that the structure of heteronormativity might be so big and so well rehearsed that progressive liberal inclusion might actually be a false messiah. And so I want to re-understand Lionel's story. No longer, it is, no longer do I want to read it as a story of a past which has been superseded by progress, Instead, I want to read it, I want to mash up time and read it as instructive now. So let's reread it. Lionel had a revelation. And revelation, as I said, will always refer to redemption and the messianic. And in this case, the revelation was maybe more Rosenzweigian than the Buberian. The revelation included command or mitzvah as part of it. Therefore, the practitioner of mitzvah walks, or to, to use the language of Professor Melissa Raphael, dances the way of the halakha, the way, the going, towards the redemption, the messianic redemption that arises from that particular revelation. The act of the mitzvah itself is therefore an enactment of the messianic. So now let's think about Lionel's uh, story again. The practice of Lionel's mitzvot of gay sex, meaning the practice of the devotee of God who practices sex between men outside of the heteronormative, or we could also use the word outside of the homonormative, uh, outside of homonormative or normative assumptions about sex and relationships, and abides by the mitzvot that our teacher Lionel brought down from the Sinai of the gay sauna in Amsterdam, 
that is creating a messianic redemption moment in and of itself. What Lionel would call a taste of heaven. So this, <laughs> this is a messianic scenario where men or strangers, and we, if you think about men at a time of war like the current one, often when straight men who are strangers to one another meet, they fight each other and hurt one another. So this messianic vision is a vision of men holding one another, loving one another, being kind to one another, giving pleasure to one another, where no women are hurt in the process. Beautiful vision, maybe. But how does that fit into the broader understanding of Jewish messianism? Let's consider Rosh Hashanah, our most liturgically messianic of our festivals, the creation of the world is paralleled by readings in Torah of Sarah and Isaac, Han Hannah and Samuel. To enact Im imitatio Dei, to, um, to, mimic, to, to continue doing what God does, is creating new life in that frame. Or we can consider the Sheva Brachot, which I think is the most messianic of our lit liturgical compositions. I think it's beautiful. And their redemption is located in the specifically sanctified and productive sexual relations. We can consider the culture of our synagogue communities too. I think that our synagogue communities are often guided by the messianism of the child who guarantees our future. And certainly this is a guiding light of our post-Holocaust communities. And it's this messianism we rabbis declare at weddings, baby blessings, and b'nai mitzvah, Jewish messianism as the child, as new life. And I, I, I'm really into this, by the way. I'm, I'm, I, love, I, I love it. Um, but I... But I want to I want to say uh, within the framework of liberal with liberal progressive inclusion, a gay man, for example, can be assimilated into those mitzvah and those practices which signify the messianism of the child. If the gay man is willing to put into the shadow or ignore some of the kind of practices that might be connected to gay male culture, so the question so the question is: Can, can the messianism which arises from Lionel's sauna revelation? coexist with the, the messianism of the child. Uh, there's a psychoanalytic theorist uh, and a queer theorist, Leo Bassani, who asks a question, is the rectum a grave? His queer theorist colleague, Lee Edelman, declares that queer sex might be the embodiment of the death drive. If we take their ideas seriously, and we could do for a few minutes before maybe critiquing them, then the messianism of gay sex is on its eschatological horizon, meaning like on its kind of end point, actually a practice of no future, it then might become an anti-messianism. There might not be redemption from death in that case. So no, maybe the anti-messianism of gay sex cannot coexist with the messianism of the child because the one would negate the other. Only of course, Paradoxically, they do coexist because I exist, for example. <laughs> and heeding Sheila's warning, I no longer bring, I no longer seek to bring my whole self wholesale to Judaism. I do not integrate the child censored messianism of the Torah I teach in my community rabbinate and the potentially, maybe in this frame, anti messianism of non homo normative gay sexual practice. On the one hand, this is frequently uncomfortable and sometimes an impossible place to be in. On the other hand, it's the greatest of privileges because it means that I spend my life walking in the footprints laid out by my teachers, Rabbi Sheila Shulman and Rabbi Lionel Blue. <laughs>